From Hollywood, it's time now for Bob Bailey as... Johnny Dollar. Dave Borger, Johnny. Marine and Maritime Casualty. Hiya, Dave. Awful. I'm in mourning, Johnny, for Molly Kay. Oh, sorry, Dave. You have my sympathy. Save it. This is money, not sentiment. We had her insured for a cool half million. You mean dames come that high these days? No, but a rusty old tub of a freighter does. What happened? She steamed out of San Francisco Bay, bound for Yokohama. Twenty miles off the Golden Gate, she upended and departed this world forever. Real sudden, huh? Too sudden. I don't like sudden things. Why don't you fly out there, Johnny? Take a look at the remains. Sure, as long as you're willing to pay for it. You're hired, but be careful. Don't get yourself killed. While I'm on an expense account? Dave, you've got a lot to learn. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office, Marine and Maritime Casualty Limited, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of my expenditures during the investigation of the Molly K matter. Item 1, 164.50, plane fare and incidentals, Hartford to San Francisco. It was mid-morning when I landed, and the city on the seven hills glittered under the bright sun like a fabulous hoard of jewels. A cool, crisp breeze was driving the usual night's bank of fog out toward the open sea and the clear waters of the bay danced and sparkled from the touch of the wind. It was a day and a place that felt lusty with life and the joy of living. And yet 36 hours before, the freighter Molly Kay, with a crew of 43 men, had steamed out across this same bay, passed under the high arch of the Golden Gate Bridge, and disappeared into the gray oblivion of the Pacific, gone down to her death. Item 2, $1.55, local transportation. Limousine to my hotel where I barely had time to check in, then a taxi down to the foot of Market Street where Harbor Master Tim O'Rourke, a grizzled old veteran of the port, was about to preside at a preliminary board of inquiry in the ferry building. All right, boys, all right, let's have it quiet. Now, all of us know what we're here for, but just to make it official, I have to announce that this is the preliminary hearing of a board of inquiry investigating the loss by sinking of the vessel Molly Kay. Needless to say, for you that know me, the proceedings are going to be pretty informal. Yeah, you can be sure of that. All right. Now, the bare facts seem to be go something like this. The Molly Kay cleared her berth at Pier 29 at 10, 12 p.m. night before last. Destination, Yokohama. Primary cargo, grain. The Molly K was a steel hull Class C freighter, oil fueled, with a steam turbine drive. She was under the command of her owner, Captain Edgar Brawley of San Francisco. Now, is uh, is Captain Brawley present? I am. But if you're expecting me to tell. Well, later, Captain, later. All right. At 10.38, the Molly K dropped her pilot and proceeded on out to sea. Fog conditions were reported at the time as medium to dense. Then at 12.49 a.m., the radio operator on duty at the Point Bonita Coast Guard Station picked up the first distress signal. Now I'll call the first witness, the officer in charge of the rescue operation, Lieutenant Commander Barton Fields of the United States Coast Guard. Will you take the witness chair, Commander? Now, raise your right hand, Commander. Do you swear the testimony... The inquiry moved along, but not much came out that wasn't already known. The Coast Guard commander testified that five minutes after the first distress call, the Molly Kay had sent a second SOS, stating she was sinking rapidly by the bow. According to the message, the vessel had struck a submerged derelict. The captain and crew had taken to the lifeboats, and two of these were picked up immediately. A third boat, missed in the heavy fog, made shore and beached under its own efforts. Now, according to this report, two men, William Mack, machinist, and Benny Wong, steward, are still missing. Now, further search has now been abandoned, and these men are presumed to be dead. I think that's all, Commander. Thank you. 
Now, will radio operator G.A. Beck take the witness chair? While the testimony went on, I studied the teletypes from the home office that I'd picked up at the hotel. Again, nothing much that wasn't already known, with a few exceptions. A stray fact or two, a couple of odd details, nothing else. But the seeds of suspicion are pretty small. And if they're kept well watered, sometimes they grow up into nice, tall, blooming hunch plants. <laughs> then Chairman O'Rourke called the witness I was most interested in. Will Captain Edgar Brawley please take the chair? The man who stood to collect a half million dollars if the sinking was legitimate. But I was pretty sure it wasn't. Raise your right hand, Captain. Do you swear that the testimony you are about to give is the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. You can sit down. He was a man about 50, maybe older, but he had the body of a young bull. Hard, stubborn, belligerent. He figured to be a tough lad to tangle with in court or on the deck of a ship. Now, Captain, will you tell us what happened in your own words? Starting where? From the time you dropped the pilot. Uh, unless something happened earlier that might have some bearing on this case. There wasn't nothing that happened earlier or later that got any bearing on it. We hit a submerged derelict, that's all. Now, what more do you want to know? Your story, Captain, just for the record. Be no different from what you've already heard from all the rest of them here. This is an official board of inquiry, Captain, whether you like it or not. I'll be the judge of what's important and what isn't. Yes, sir. Well, after we dropped the pilot, I set a course north 77 west, aimed to bring us into the main shipping lane by daybreak. And I assigned the watches, had the deck gear stowed away, opened the trip log, got ready to settle down for the night's run. Normal procedure, in other words. That's what I told you. There wasn't nothing that Go was... Go on with your story, Captain. My first officer took over the bridge, like he already told you he did, and I went to my quarters. What was the weather like at the time? Same as it had been all evening. So foggy you couldn't see a hundred feet from the bridge. <clears throat> And you took all the usual precautions prescribed for such a condition? Of course. Go on. Well, it was a while before midnight. I was still in my quarters, awake in my bunk when she hit. It was a big crash, like a torpedo had took us, and the lights went out. We started losing the headway, and a couple of minutes later, the engineer cut the engines and pulled his fires. Water had busted right through number one and number two bulkheads and was rising fast in the boiler room. Must have ripped half the bottom out of her. What did you do next? I called the engine room gang on deck and... Well, then I... I give the order to abandon ship. She sank less than ten minutes after we got the boats on. Well, I... I guess that's about the size of it. <clears throat> Submerged derelict in the shipping lane. It was an accident, pure and simple. All right, Captain. I guess there's nothing Mr. more Chairman. we can... Mr. Dollar? I wonder if I could have your permission to ask the captain a few questions. Well, it's kind of unusual, but like I said, this is an informal hearing, so, um... Captain Brawley, Mr. Dollar is a special investigator for the insurance company that holds the policy on your ship. His position here is unofficial, of course, and <laughs> you're under no obligation. It's up to you. Well, I've told you all I know about it. I got nothing to hide if that's what you're talking about. Not one single thing. I'll... All right. Let him ask till he's blue in the face. Go ahead, Mr. Dollar. Thank you. Captain Brawley, we've heard quite a lot about your last sailing for Yokohama night before last. But there hasn't been any mention of the first time you started to leave, a little over a week ago. I had no bearing on this. Maybe not. But let's talk about it anyway. According to my report, you were six hours out of San Francisco when you radioed the Coast Guard to stand by. You had a cargo fire in number two hole. That's right. A little while later, you told them you had the fire under control, but you were returning to port. Oh, I wanted to check the damage, make sure the ship was sound. Yeah. So you laid up in harbor for a week. You filed a claim with our home office in Hartford for estimated damages of $6,300. Come to more... But when the company appraiser called at your office on Pier 29, you refused him admittance to the ship, and an hour later, you wired Hartford and canceled your claim. That's right. 
A $6,300 loss, fully covered by insurance, and you suddenly decided not to make any claim for it? I'd have lost more if I had claimed it. How do you figure that? Because I had found out that I'd have to lay up here for another two weeks while that sneaking company of yours checked the facts, as they called it. I had a cargo on board. I had a delivery date ahead of me. Couldn't afford to waste two weeks. What caused the fire? I don't know. Who, uh, who found it and reported it? Uh... Man named Bill Mack. All right, all right. He was one of the two men that drowned when the ship went down. What of it? What are you trying to make out of it? All right, let's quiet down now. Let's have order in here. Now, at the time of the accident, Captain, the sinking, we're led to believe that it was a little foggy out that night. You doubt it? No, not in the least. That's why I can't quite understand how you managed to see that, uh, that submerged derelict. I didn't see it. Then who did? Nobody, as far as I know. That fog, you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. There was no fog the next day. The Coast Guard searched the area for hours, and they didn't see it either. Well, it probably sunk when we hit it. It... Just what are you getting at, Dollar? How do you know there was any submerged derelict, Captain? What do you mean? You said there was a big crash. All the crew members described the accident as a sudden hard shock. In fact, one of them, Mr. Hawkins there, who was up for it on bow lookout, said it felt like a blast, like something... Oh, you don't. Oh, no, you don't. Uh, Mr. Hawkins... I didn't say it was no blast. What I said was it just kind of felt like one. You ain't going to go putting no words like that in my mouth, Mr. Dollar. You ain't going to get me mixed up in this. Mixed up in what, Mr. Hawkins? In this here, whatever's going on, or whatever you're trying to claim is going on. I just don't know nothing about it, about anything. And I, I just don't want anybody putting words in my mouth, that's all. Claiming I said something I didn't. I, I, well... Just what exactly is it you're hitting at, Mr. Dollar? Not hitting, Captain, I'm saying it. I don't think there was a derelict. I think the Molly K was sunk by an explosive charge placed in a hole. Are you accusing me of that? I'm not accusing anybody, not yet. All right, all right, now let's settle Are down. Are you playing that sink my own ship just to collect a few lousy bucks worth of insurance? I don't know who did it, Captain Brawley, but I'm going to find out. And whoever it was, they're in it up to their neck. Two men died when the Molly K went down, so this thing's a whole lot worse than just a crooked insurance racket. It's a case of cold-blooded murder. <laughs> Outside, after the hearing adjourned, I turned west and walked along the Embarcadero. I looked at the crowds and the sunshine and the seagulls out over the bay. It was all brisk and bright and cheerful. But I felt cold in the pit of my stomach. They were scared in there, all of them, scared to death. The smell of fear in that hearing room was so thick you could cut it with a knife. And I meant to find out why. Now, here's our star, Bob Bailey, to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this story. Thanks. Tomorrow night, a strange girl and a strange threat. And a promise that's stranger than both. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, the entire production is under the direction of Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for Bob Bailey as... Johnny Dollar. You don't know me, Mr. Dollar, but you're going to. Well, I can hardly wait. You won't have to wait. I want you to meet me tonight. Where? On the waterfront, 9 o'clock. Yes? It's dark down there at 9. It might be dangerous. Are you scared? Strange women always scare me. Where on the waterfront? Pier 29. That's where the Molly Kay was birthed before she sank. Molly Kay was my mother. Meet me at nine? I don't know. Blind dates never work out for me. I'm always sorry afterwards. You won't be sorry this time. 
Is that a promise? That's a promise. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, present location San Francisco, to the Home Office Marine and Maritime Casualty Limited, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Molly K matter. Expense account continued. Item three, $4.65, food. I needed it. It had been a rough day, rough from the standpoint of legwork. I'd covered most of the usual sources and usual angles. And for all I learned, I might as well have stayed in bed. The freighter Molly Kay had sailed out of San Francisco Harbor and gone down in the Pacific. And nobody wanted to talk about it. They were all too busy shaking in their boots and looking over their shoulders, scared to death. I was even beginning to look over my shoulder. Item four, 70 cents, taxi to the Embarcadero. Sure, I kept that blind date. I wouldn't have missed it for the world. Here, keep the change. It was dark and lonely along the waterfront. The fog was down, drifting in off the bay, dimming the scattered streetlights with a damp haze and muffling the sounds of the city. Alcatraz, lost and hidden somewhere behind the murky, wet blanket, kept sounding its mournful warning across the water. And the night gulls seemed to cry out an answer to it. I crossed the siding tracks and headed toward Pier 29 and toward whatever was waiting for me there. Or whoever. The office and warehouse of the Brawley Shipping Company, owner of the Molly K, was about halfway out the pier. I'd been there earlier in the day and found it closed and locked. But there was a dim light burning there now. I headed toward it. Just about then, as I passed under the last wharf light and turned toward the office door, I started to get that old feeling. I'd had it before in other places. Once in the heart of an Orinoco jungle, in an alleyway in the Casbah of Algiers, one time in London, Soho, and again in Suez. Somewhere, close by, hidden by the fog and shadows, there was somebody watching me. I stood listening, straining to hear some telltale sound in the darkness. Nothing. But there were a dozen hiding places within a radius of 50 feet, and I wasn't fool enough to start searching them, not knowing what I'd find. I turned to open the door to the Brawley office. Get your hands up, Mac. He'd been standing behind a post right beside the door. Okay. Now, what are you prowling around here for? I was restless, couldn't sleep. And I loved that foghorn. Wanted to get close to it. Knock it sort off, of... wise guy. Gun in your back, not a peppermint stick. Oh, don't say things like that. I faint easy. One more smart crack it. Wait a minute. Turn around toward the light. Sure. I'm always glad to oblige. Just suck her up. All right, come on, let go of it. Stop it, you let go of that gun. You're gonna break my All right. Get... Come on, get up, get up. Come on, on your feet. Okay. Okay, Dollar. So they're right about you. You are tough. Is that what they say? I've heard it around. Then how come you jumped me? I didn't know it was you, not till you turned toward the light. Just saw somebody was prowling around the office here. Who's there? What's going on? It's all right, Ellen. Dean, what are you doing here? I could ask you the same thing. Why, I just came down to do some work on the books and... Oh. This is that insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar. Yes, I know. I... What do you mean, you know? I asked Mr. Dollar to meet me here tonight. Why? What are you up to? Nothing. I wanted to talk to him, that's all. Down here alone, huh? This time of night. Dean, suppose we talk about it tomorrow. Okay. That's the way you feel. It's not a matter of how we'll discuss it tomorrow. All right. Oh, uh, the gun, Dollar. Do I get it back? Oh, sure. Here you are. Don't uh, let anybody take it away from you now. Don't worry. They won't. I'll see you tomorrow, Dean. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Come in, Mr. Dollar. I followed her into a suite of offices that were a lot plusher on the inside than they were on the outs. 
Mahogany paneling, leather chairs, rugs, sofa, an open fire burning, small but cozy, like the girl herself. So we talked. The weather, the fog, the weather yesterday, how we like San Francisco, sparring type talk. Then finally came the tip-off that we were going to get down to business. Would you like a drink, Mr. Dollar? I poured scotch for both of us, and the clink of ice served as opening bell for the first round. Mr. Dollar sounds so oddly formal. Do you mind if I call you Johnny? Johnny it is. And you? Ellen Brawley. I guess I am a little slow in introducing myself. But it upset me. Dean being out there, I mean. And acting the way he did. You're Captain Brawley's daughter. Yes. As I told you on the phone, Molly Kay was my mother's name. Father thought the world of her. It broke his heart when she died. Later, he named his ship after her. And now the ship has gone, too. Yes. Ellen, what about this man you call Dean? How does he figure in this? Dean Sutton. He's an exporter. I've... Well, I've known him for some time. He's not usually the way he was tonight. Jealousy always makes a difference. Jealousy. Sure, it's stuck out all over him. He just does business with my father. It was his cargo that sank with the Molly Kay. Grain, bound for Japan. Oh, I see. I've gone out with him quite a lot, but he takes far too much for granted. I'm a free agent, Johnny. I call my own shots. Yeah, I guess you do. So tonight you call me. I heard about the hearing. How you questioned my father. Accused him of sinking his own ship to collect the insurance. I didn't accuse him. It amounted to that, didn't it? I said I was sure somebody had done it. He put the shoe on his own foot before I even had it out of the box. What makes you so sure? Oh, a lot of little things that don't add up. What little things don't add up, Johnny? Oh, this and that. Did you know your father put a heavy mortgage on the Molly K seven months ago? How did you find out? Bureau of Records, Maritime Division. Know when the mortgage comes due? Next month. He had to install new boilers. That's why he did it. And he'd have been able to pay it off after this last voyage. He'd also be able to pay it off after he collected the insurance and have a lot left over. You're wrong. You don't know my father. No, I don't. Do you know who holds that mortgage? A woman named Lu Tang. That's right. Been in owner Shanghai, Lu. She owns a nightclub up in Chinatown. (laughs) Quite a girl. You know her? Very well. All right, Ellen. Let's quit circling around and get to the point. What's on your mind? I don't know. Nothing, really, I guess. I just wanted to tell you that you're wrong. About my father, I mean. If the Molly Kay was sunk deliberately... He had no part in it. I'll make a note of that, even though your opinion may be a little bit prejudiced. Well... Are you leaving? Might be a good idea, don't you think? Wait. Johnny. Yeah? I was... sort of hoping we'd be friends, maybe. Oh, I feel very friendly toward you. Do you, Johnny? As much as much as this. That much, Johnny? That's uh, pretty friendly. I told you. I call my own shots. I know. But you didn't tell me you're engaged to Dean Sutton. I found that out from a newspaper file. It was all a mistake. It's his idea. I thought you always called your own shots. Don't go, Johnny. I I promised you on the phone that if you came, you'd wouldn't be sorry. I'm not. Good night, Ellen. Outside on the pier, the fog was thicker than ever. The wharf lights were dim glows in the swirl of mist, and sounds, even close ones, were muffled and hollow. I couldn't figure Ellen Brawley, at least not completely, where she stood in this and the reason for the pitch she'd made. I left the pier and turned west along the Embarcadero. Mr. Dollar? Huh? Over here. Get out of the light. Evening, sir. You're out late, Mr. Hawkins. Well, I I was waiting around. I, I kind of wanted to talk to you. I saw you come in the taxi cab earlier. All right, let's talk. I hope you don't hold it against me, jumping up in the hearing room that way, but I was scared. Scared that... of what, Mr. Hawkins? I don't rightly know. That's the trouble. 
But there's something strange going on, Mr. Dollar. And it ain't safe for a man to let on he notices. The whole crew feels the same way. That's why they ain't talking about it. About what? Things that's happened. Things that ain't been brought out yet. And I wouldn't be talking neither if Bill Mack hadn't been a mighty good friend of mine. Bill Mack. He was one of the two men who went down with the ship. That he did. May he rest in peace. But you're wrong, Mr. Dollar. There wasn't two men. Bill was the only one. What? That Chinese steward, Benny Wong, he didn't drown. He was in that lifeboat that got to shore. Then the men in the boat knew it. Why didn't they say so? They were scared to. He disappeared later, and they was all scared to say anything. I don't know what's happened to him since... Here, back of this wall. Keep your head down. I crouched behind the concrete tide wall, my gun drawn, and peered into the darkness, trying to catch some sign of movement behind the blanket of fog, listening for some faint sound that might be the giveaway. Nothing. And to go hunting in those shadows against somebody who knew the waterfront would be about as healthy as stepping out in front of a truck. I gotta get out of here, Mr. Dollar. I gotta get away from here. Hawkins, wait. I ain't doing any more talking. And it won't do you no good to ask. They know every move a man makes. I I got nothing more to say. All I want is to stay alive. So that was that. Fear again. He was scared to death. And I couldn't very well blame him. That shot had come close. But there was one thing Hawkins hadn't thought of. I had. And I didn't like the thought. That bullet might not have been meant for him. It could have been aimed at me. Now, here's our star, Bob Bailey, to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this story. Thanks. Tomorrow night, we find out that a dead man can tell a tale. It all depends on how he died. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, the entire production is under the direction of Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for Bob Bailey as... Johnny Dollar. Guess who, Johnny? Lou. Lou Tang. When they told me you had called, my heart jumped and beat faster. It has been a long time. Too long. Hey, look, I want to see you, Lou. Where are you? They only gave me a phone number. It's a waterfront bar, foot of Drum Street, Sailor's Hangout. Then I'll call a taxi. No, be... wait there. I've got a drunk on my hands. Well, get rid of him. Or of her. Can't do it, honey. This is a valuable drunk. You wait. I'll get there as soon as I can. And look, will you do me a favor, Lou? Anything you want, Johnny. Uh, well, there's a man named Benny Wong. I think he's been hiding out in Chinatown for the last two days. Can you find him for me? So that is why you're here. The sinking of the Marley K. That's right, Lou. Too bad, Johnny. I'm sorry to hear that. Awfully sorry. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location San Francisco, to the Home Office Marine and Maritime Casualty Limited, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Molly K matter. Expense account continued. Item five, $11 even, drinks. Consumed by one Josiah Hawkins, able-bodied seaman. Last berth, ship's carpenter on the freighter Molly K. And Hawkins was scared, scared half to death. So the fear worked against the liquor, and the drinks weren't doing much good. Who was you talking to on the phone? A friend. You say anything about me? About me being with you? Nope. How about another drink, Mr. Hawkins? I had enough. 
What's the name of your friend, Mr. Dollar? Oh, you wouldn't know her. Just a girl I know here in town. Oh, a girl. Mr. Hawkins, did Bill Mack have a girl? Yes, he got himself engaged to a girl. I know what you're aiming at, Mr. Dollar. You're trying to play on my sympathy. He was your friend. That he was. One of the best. And now he's dead. Drowned in the Pacific when the Molly Kay went down. Whoever sank her is responsible for his death. You can help me if you would. It wouldn't bring him back. I got to think of myself. You're in more danger before you talk than you'd be afterwards. The whole idea is to keep you from talking. Huh? Sure, there's sense in that, all right. Somebody shot at you out there on the docks, tried to kill you. You'll never be safe as long as they're running loose. Well, Mr. Hawkins? The Molly K was sunk deliberate. We're sure of that. All of us that was aboard her, things just wasn't right even before it happened. What things? Well, that fire, for one, ten days ago, the first time we started out for Yokohama. Bill Mack was the one that discovered it. Did Mack think the fire had been set? That he did. He told the captain that. And you know what happened, Mr. Dollar? What happened? Captain Brawley knocked him down the bridge ladder. Told him to keep his mouth shut and not go around spreading wild rumors. All right. The second time you sailed, what happened? Well, as soon as we cleared the gate and headed out to sea, Bill and me was on watch. He had me cover for him while he sneaked down in the hold to see what he could find out. He still hadn't come back when it happened. I think you was right, Mr. Dollar, what what you said at the hearing. What do you mean? We didn't hit no derelict. An explosion, that's what it was. In the bottom of the forward hold somewhere. I was on the bow deck right above it when it happened. What about that Chinese steward? The one who got ashore and then disappeared. Did you notice anything special about him? Benny Wong? Yeah. No. We was only a couple of hours out of port. I don't even remember seeing him. One thing, though, that seemed kind of funny at the time. What was that? The first mate done all the hiring for this trip, same as always, just one exception. Benny Wong was hired on by Captain Brawley himself. Uh Uh-huh. And something else, Mr. Dollar, about Bill Mack being drowned. He was wrong about that. Bill Mack is alive? No. No, he was dead before the Molly Kay ever sunk. What? I went looking for him as soon as it happened. And I found him down on the lower boat deck, lying in a pool of blood. Somebody cut his throat. I'll have another drink now. I sat there looking at him across the table, not saying anything. There was nothing I could say. Bill Mack had been his friend. I thought over what he just told me, tried to fit it in with what I already knew. It didn't add up to an answer yet. Not quite. But it was close. And it was getting closer all the time. Mr. Dollar, it's him. Huh? Captain Brawley over there. He just come in. Yeah. He's seen us, too. He's coming over this way. I got to get out of here. Sit down, Mr. Hawkins. He won't start anything. You don't know him. You don't know how he is when he gets mad. No, but it looks like I'm going to find out. Well, Hawkins, seems like you're not very particular about the company you keep. Neither am I, Captain. Pull up a chair. What are you up to, Dollar? Offering him a bribe to testify against me? Don't need to. There's enough against you already. Yeah, there will be, more than likely, when you and them smart company lawyers get through. You insurance people are all alike. You're right there to collect when it's due you, but you squirm when it comes to paying off. Well, now, that depends on the circumstances, Captain, and in this case, well, I wouldn't go spending that money yet if I were you. That's what you've been telling them, huh? When I've got anything to tell, I'll tell it to the court. Yeah, along with anybody else you can turn against me. Like my own daughter, for instance. She even sneaked around and tried to turn her against me. Not that that took much doing. And Dean Sutton, owner of the cargo. But there's a limit to what a man will take, Dollar. And I took enough already. Now, you better quit pushing me. I'm warning you. I'll take your warning and stick it where it'll do the most good. 
You've been trying to block every attempt I've made to get to the bottom of this thing. You've dragged your feet every step of the way deliberately. Dollar, nobody talks to me like that. Then it's time somebody did. I think you're in this thing right up to your big fat neck. And if you are, I'm going to pin it on you. Not just for swindling. If you were behind the sinking of the Molly K, I'm going to see to it that you stand trial for murder, too. I warned you once. Now, Mr. Dollar. Oh, no. oh, all right, Captain. Learn it the hard way. <laughs> Watch out, he's grabbing the bottle. No. Come and get it, Dollar! Sorry, the party's over right now. You better get out of here, Hawkins. He's not going to feel very friendly when he comes to. You're the only man I ever seen stand up to him, Mr. Dollar. There was one other one, Bill Mack. I left Captain Brawley lying there on the floor. They were throwing water on him when I walked out. I hadn't wanted the fight, but there'd been no choice. And it had given me one new fact to fit in. The captain's coat fell open when he hit the floor. And I saw he was packing a gun. Expense account, item six, 80 cents. A taxi fare to Chinatown and a rendezvous with Lu Tang. Shanghai Lu. A strange woman, this one. Wise, shrewd. And alert. Hard and tough when she feels that way. Soft as a kitten when she feels that way. Her nationality, history, age, nothing certain about any of that. But there's one thing that is certain. She's the most beautiful woman I've ever known. It is good to see you, Johnny. How long has it been? Last year, Lou, in Paris. How could you forget? I didn't forget. I only wanted to see if you had. Kiss me, Johnny. Oh, oh. <clears throat> I uh, came here to talk business. Oh, business. I don't feel like talking business. Simmer down, baby. Let's get married. All right. But first, when? let's uh, tomorrow. Now, if Why you'll... not tonight? It's too late. We'd have to wake somebody up. Always problems, reasons. I don't think you even want to marry me. Sure I do. I've been mad, too, for years. Then why didn't you in Paris? Lo, it's no time to go into that again. Look, I'm on a case, a rough one, and it's just possible that you may be mixed up in it. Johnny, I did not sink the Molly case, so there you are. That takes care of the business. Let's get married. Will you sit back down there? That does not take care of the business. What more do you want to know? Several things. Benny Wong, for instance. That man you asked me about? Yeah, they said he went down with the Molly K, but I found out different from one of the crew. I have not found Benny yet. I have people looking, so why don't you and I... Lou, I've known you too long. You're not fooling me. Fooling you? The patter is good, but it's not covering the fact that you're bothered. You've always bothered me, Johnny. That's not it. How do you figure in this thing, Lou? I don't really know what you mean by this thing, Johnny. You had a pretty heavy stake in the Molly K. A hundred thousand dollar mortgage loaned to Captain Brawley. A sound business deal, that's all. I have investments in many ships that sail out of San Francisco. Ah, and of course the investment was covered by insurance. Naturally. I made sure of that before I advanced the loan. Don't let the soft brown eyes fool you, Johnny. I'm a hard-headed businesswoman. Yeah, I know. It was a business deal, nothing else. It showed every chance of being a profitable voyage. He was carrying a cargo of wheat. The Tokyo grain market has been advancing steadily for three months. As to what happened, I don't know anything about it. I don't understand it. That's straight, Johnny. That's all I know. What about this fellow, Dean Sutton? Do you know him, Lou? I've met him. I understand he's engaged to Captain Brawley's daughter. But beyond the... Pardon me a moment. I'll see who it is. The visitor was a young Chinese lad. She stepped outside to talk to him, and I lit a cigarette and waited for her. I thought over what she'd said, tried to see behind it, and to decide whether to believe it or not. Lu Tang was not a person you could push. I stood up when she came back into the room. You're not leaving, Johnny. Yeah, I think I'd better. But you'll see me tomorrow? You know I will. What if I were mixed up in this? Would you send me to jail? You know the answer. Yes. And you're the only man I know who would. I'd be gentle about it, though. I think you really would. 
You're sweet, Johnny. Awfully sweet. I'm a doll. I've made up my mind to take no part in this, to stay completely out of it. But I'm going to tell you something. What do you mean? That man who just came to the door, I've had him out looking for Benny Wong. Has he found him? Not yet. But he's found out something about him. Johnny, if the Malike was sunk on purpose, how do you think it was done? By an explosion in the bottom of the fort hold. Hmm. Benny Wong was a demolition sergeant during World War II. He's rather well known as an expert on explosives. Now, here's our star, Bob Bailey, to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this story. Thanks. Tomorrow night, a double cross, a double play, and a lovely girl forces the jealous sea to give up its dead. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, the entire production is under the direction of Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for Bob Bailey as... Johnny Dollar. Hi, Johnny. Dan McKay, Harbor Police. Dan, I was planning to drop by and see you about the sinking of the Molly K, but I've uh, been pretty busy since I got here. Yeah, so I've heard. Johnny, you're under arrest. What did I do? Park in a red zone, walk on the grass? I'm not kidding. I mean it. Well, what's the charge? Well, let's see. Uh, assault and battery, aggravated assault, assault with intent to do bodily injury. Hold it, Dan. That's uh, enough. Don't you want to know who signed it? I already know. That's practically an admission of guilt. You know that. But I've got witnesses. So has he. Huh? I think you'd better come down and talk about it. Or you'll send out the wagon, is that it? I'm serious, Johnny. All right, Dan, I'll be down. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location San Francisco, to the Home Office Marine and Maritime Casualty Limited, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Molly K matter. Expense account continued. Item 7, a mere 60 cents. Taxi from my hotel to the foot of Market Street and headquarters of Inspector Dan McKay in charge of Harbor Police. I'd known Dan for years, well enough to realize that knowing him wouldn't make any difference, not when he had a warrant to serve. I knew the charge wouldn't stick, of course, but it could slow me down, and I figured that was exactly why it had been filed. You may be right, Johnny. Maybe Captain Brawley did file charges just for nuisance value. Keep you out of his way for a day or two. That's exactly what he did. Nevertheless, the charge was filed, and a warrant has been issued. So what are you going to do about it? I know what I'd like to do about it. Uh Uh-uh. That's against the law, too. You know, you could be wrong, Johnny. Brawley may not be guilty of the Molly K sinking. I told you the whole story, Dan. The facts add up. What do you think? I think you've got an awful strong case. But it's still based on circumstantial evidence. Well, what else is there to base it on? The rest of the evidence is out past the harbor there, out beyond the Golden Gate, a mile below the surface of the Pacific. Yeah, yeah, I know. Most of the cases we handle here in the harbor division are like that. Well, then you can see the problem I'm up against. Yeah, I can see it all right. That's a big harbor out there, Johnny. Biggest natural harbor in the world. A lot of square miles of water. A lot of miles of shoreline. And a lot of ways of covering up a crime. 
As far as disposing of physical evidence, it's true. Body can be thrown into the bay, a weapon, so on. Sometimes we recover it, sometimes we don't. It's tough, Johnny. Yeah, I imagine. Real tough. Hey, that's the SS Maritonia, arriving from Ceylon, Java, the Philippines. She'll dock at Pier 14. The cargo is probably spices, mahogany, raw ore. Nice looking ship. Beautiful. They drive me crazy, Johnny, watching them here from the window. I should have gone to sea. Oh, well. Anyway, since we don't have physical evidence in a lot of cases, we've learned to rely on other things. Such as? The human elements, Johnny. You've turned up a lot of facts, true. You've made a good deal more progress on this case than I have. Than you have? What do you mean? Tim O'Rourke sent me the report of the inquiry board. I've been working on the case ever since. Now, uh, you got a pretty convincing bunch of facts. But I know Captain Brawley, by reputation at least. Look, Dan, I know what you're getting at. People who know Brawley think he's honest. O'Rourke said the same thing. Right. Tough, hard, violent temper, a slave driver, but not a crook. An honest man can get under pressure sometimes, get pushed beyond his depth. It happens every day. Yeah, yeah, but Johnny, even then, he reacts according to his pattern. Here's what I'm getting at. That murder on board the Molly Kay just before she sank, you said Hawkins told you the man had been knifed. Now, I can see Brawley slugging somebody with fist, club, or, or bottle, or even shooting a man. But not a knife. It's not in his nature. That's what I mean by human elements. And you're right, Dan. I agree with you. I don't think it was Brawley who killed him. Here's the way I see it. Brawley was pressed for cash. The mortgage on his ship was due in 30 days. He was carrying that grain for Dean Sutton on a contingency basis. He might not make any money, or at least not enough. He was probably doing it as a favor to his daughter. She and Dean Sutton are engaged. Yeah, I know, So the first time out, he tried setting that fire on board. It didn't work. One of the crew, Bill Mack, discovered it before it got started. The Molly Kay returned to port, and Brawley filed an insurance claim. Then he got scared off an investigation and withdrew it. That's all guesswork, Johnny. So far, his second attempt, he contacted an expert on explosives, Benny Wong. And Benny pulled off the job for him, blew the bottom out of the ship and sank it. And what about the knifing? Well, Bill Mack was suspicious. He was prowling around the hold and caught Benny in the act of setting the explosive. Benny killed him, figuring the sinking would cover for him. But by accident, Hawkins stumbled onto the body before the ship went down. Well, that adds up, Johnny. It's hard to argue with you. I just can't see a captain sinking his own ship. It's been done before. Yeah, I know. Not everybody feels about them the way you do, Dan. And a half million is a lot of money. That's true. But 25 years of command means a lot, too. Deep sense of responsibility. Integrity. But... Oh, pardon me. Inspector McKay. Oh, yeah. Just a moment. It's for you, Johnny. It was Lu Tang, Shanghai Lu. She'd called the hotel and found out where to reach me. For once, she didn't try to play games. She spoke briefly and straight to the point. And she told me what I wanted to know the most. When I hung up, I knew I was on the last lap. I had the case right in my hand. Well, what's up, Johnny? What is it? Dan, how would you like to come along and talk to the man who blew up the Molly Kay? Item 8, 80 cents, another taxi, a short run from the foot of market to Fisherman's Wharf. Lu Tang's spies had told her Benny Wong was holed up in a back room of the Fa Song Fish Company out on the docks. And they said he was scared, armed, and dangerous. There's the Fa Song layout, Johnny. Right there, the warehouse in the end. Yeah. Well, let's go around the gangway. Lu Tang said the room is on the back corner. Uh, say, Johnny, uh, why don't you wait here? Let me take him. This kind of thing is part of my job. But he's my pigeon, Dan. I found him first. There's a door at the back. That must be it. Yeah, only one it could be. Besides, I'm under arrest. If you left me alone, I might escape. Yeah, yeah, sure. You got a gun, Johnny? Yeah. All right. Let's go. 
We moved quietly up to the blank wooden door opening onto the gangway over the water. There were no windows in the back wall, so we were certain we weren't being watched from inside. We stopped at the door, and McKay reached for the knob and tried it gently. It's unlocked. Good. You ready? Hey, go ahead. Hey, what... The... Hold it, police officers! Drop that gun. Drop it fast! This doesn't look much like Benny Wong, Johnny. No, it doesn't. Now, look here. What do you, you do, Dean? Go around with a gun in your hand all the time? You're making a mistake, Dollar. I don't know any more about this than you do. Any more about what? What are you doing here, Never Dean? Never mind, Johnny. Here's what he means. Huh? Oh. Well. So we don't talk to Benny. Shot three times. Yeah. Any one of the bullets would have done the job. You weren't taking any chances, were you, Dean? I didn't shoot him. I just got here. How did you know where he was hiding? I didn't. I didn't know anything about him. I got a phone call. Somebody said to meet them here. Said they'd give me the lowdown on the sinking of the Molly K. What somebody? Who was it? I don't know. Man or woman? A uh, man, I think. Voice was muffled, so I came here to meet them. And we find you standing over a dead man with a gun in your hand. I found him like that. I figured it was a trap. I don't know anything about it. Oh, no, of course you don't. You're just a babe in the woods. Hold it, Johnny. Barking up a wrong tree. What do you mean? This man's been dead for several hours. Since early morning, I'd say. And he was shot with a 45. This gun of Sutton's is a 32. So that's that. Johnny, what was the caliber of the gun you saw Captain Brawley wearing? A 45, Dan. I'll put out a bullet and then we'll pick him up. Wind up. The bets were all in. There was nothing more ahead but the showdown. Dan tore up the warrant on me, of course, and I went back to my hotel room to wait it out. That seemed the safest place to be. Brawley would be desperate now, half out of his mind. And of all the people he hated most, I was number one. So I lay back on my bed and waited. I reached my gun from the lamp table, moved quietly over to the door, and took hold of the key. Who is it? Let me in, Johnny. Ellen. Just a second. Come on in. Has he been here, Johnny? Has who been here? My father. The last time I saw the captain, he was lying unconscious on a barroom floor. I just put him there. That was last night. Yes, I know. Well, what made you think he'd be here? I don't know. Guess I thought... I don't know what I thought. Oh, easy now, honey. I'm scared, Johnny. Hold me, please. I'm so lonely and scared. It's all right, Ellen. Easy now. He came home last night after he fought with you. He was furious. Then he left again, and I haven't seen him since. Does he have his gun with him? I guess so. I don't know. I I don't know anything. Help me, Johnny, won't you? Of course I will. Hold me tight. Kiss me. Ellen, Last honey, night look. when you kissed me, I wasn't scared then. I was lonely. Look, honey, would you... Hold me, Johnny. Oh, Wait a second. Johnny Dollar. Dan McKay, Johnny. Yeah, Dan. We picked up Brawley on the waterfront a half an hour ago. Thought you'd want to know. What's he say? Denies everything. Says he was home asleep all night. Says his daughter will back him up. Uh-uh. I happen to know different on that. Yeah, I figured he was lying. We'd already been out to his house. Found his gun. It's been fired three times, Johnny, and the bullets match. When Ellen Brawley left my room a while later, I still hadn't told her about her father's arrest. I didn't have the heart. She'd tried her best to protect him, cover for him. She'd have done anything to save him. And yet, the irony was that every move she'd made helped tighten the case against him. The scent of her perfume still hung in the air after she'd gone. It was a strange scent, subtle, disturbing. I began to feel uncomfortable, on edge. There was something familiar about that scent. And finally I tagged it. I'd noticed that same perfume in the room on the wharf, where Benny Wong lay murdered. Now, here's our star, Bob Bailey, to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this story. Thanks. 
Tomorrow night, a deadly rendezvous on the fog-shrouded waterfront and an explosion that rocked the city. The payoff. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, the entire production is under the direction of Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for Bob Bailey as... Johnny Dollar. Johnny. I've got it for you. Lou Tang. Good. What did you find out? That prices on the Tokyo grain market did break suddenly, about three weeks ago. Three weeks. Uh Uh-huh. Reason, oversupply. The price has been holding since at about 60% of the peak. A 40% drop, big enough to cause the damage. What damage? The sinking of the Molly K, a double cross, a frame-up, murder. It's as clear as crystal, Lou. Come see me later tonight. Tell me all about it. All right. Or at any rate, come and tell me about something. About a certain night in Paris, maybe? I think I'd like that very much, Johnny. Wait for me, Lou. I'll be there later. You can count on it. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location San Francisco, to the Home Office Marine and Maritime Casualty Limited, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Molly K matter. Expense account, final page. Item 9, 770, long distance calls to Hartford and New York. I was pretty sure before I called, but I had to check on it. It checked. Item 10, 80 cents, taxi from my hotel to the waterfront office of Inspector Dan McKay, Harbor Police. Uh, It's a funny deal, Johnny. I can't figure. Captain Brawley has clammed up tight. Won't answer any more questions. Doesn't want a lawyer. Won't even talk. It's a funny deal. Not when you consider the fact that he's innocent. What? What you said... I know. I argued the opposite. I was wrong, Dan. What is it, Johnny? Just plain stubbornness? No, but that's what it is with Captain Brawley. Maybe that's the tip-off, his stubborn bullheadedness. The human elements you mentioned. How are you figuring it? If Brawley were in a money jam, he'd never scheme and connive at planning a thing like that of sinking his own ship. He's too stubborn. And besides, he wasn't in a jam. I'm sure of it. Well, now, now wait a minute. He had a $100,000 mortgage to meet. I finagle some information out of the bank. The Brawley Shipping Company has a free balance of nearly $150,000 in yeah, cash assets. Yeah, but look here, Johnny. Now, you look. I started out with a motive, and I built a pretty strong case on it. Even you agreed. Everything pointed toward Captain Brawley. Sure, because somebody was helping things point toward him. What do you mean? It wasn't just the ship itself that was insured. I'm still lost, Johnny. Keep talking. All right, look. That cargo of grain was also insured by the owner with another company, not mine, and for top market value, full price. Yeah, well, keep talking. All right. The Tokyo grain market broke just four days before the Molly K was due to sail the first time. The shipper stood to lose nearly half his investment if the grain reached Yokohama at that time. Well, it didn't reach there. It's lying out there on the bottom of the Pacific. Net result, instead of taking a loss because of price, the shipper gets full price from the insurance company. It adds up, Dan. Yeah, it sure does. The shipper. I think Captain Brawley suspected him, too. That's what kept the old captain on the prod. The ship gone, under suspicion for the sinking, yet not wanting to hurt his daughter. He was caught right in the middle. But keep on holding him to make it look like we still think he's the guilty party. Well, it's that girl of his I feel sorry for, Ellen. She's the one caught in the middle. Yeah, I know. And it's going to be rough on her when she finds out. Engaged to a killer who's been using her to smash her own father. Great setup. Yeah. Well, I'll get a bulletin out. We'll pick up this Dean Sutton and bring him in. Yeah, but you know something? It'll be awful hard to pin it on him. Need evidence, something definite. Look, why don't you let me have a go at him first? Oh, it's out of the question, Johnny. Of course... If you should happen to find him before we do, well... Yeah, I might just do that, Dan. In fact, I've uh, 
kind of got a hunch I will. It was a hunch, but it might be a good one. I left Dan's office and walked east along the waterfront, following the long curve of the Embarcadero with its miles of docks and wharves. The night had settled down over the bay and the city, and with it a dark, damp blanket of fog, even heavier than the night before. And because of that and other reasons, I felt cold and lonesome and alone. I turned off the Embarcadero and walked out Pier 29. I was about 30 yards from the Brawley warehouse when I was suddenly brought up short. On the water below me, tied to a wharf piling, was a light cabin cruiser rocking gently with a swell. It had no business being there. Pier 29 was a commercial berth. My hunch was right. I moved quietly to the edge of the wharf and stood watching the little cruiser for several minutes. There was no sign of life, no sound. Finally, I climbed over the dock rail, down the wharf ladder, and stepped onto the deck. Still no sound, no movement. I moved over to the companionway door leading down below decks and reached out my hand for the latch. Then I stopped short, caught suddenly by a sharp feeling of danger. It wasn't a sense of being watched. It was deeper, more subtle, more vague. I tried to shake it off, reach again for the latch. Then the boat shifted slightly, and the dim glow from the wharf light overhead moved across the hatchway door. Inches in front of my face, I saw the glint of bare copper wires, all set to make contact if the door was open. One more move, and I'd have been blown sky high. That boat was booby-trapped. There was a light burning in the office of the Brawley Shipping Company. I knocked on the door, drew my gun, then I stepped back and waited. I leveled the gun on the door. Johnny! Are you alone, Ellen? Yes, of course. Well, come on, let's get inside. What is it, Johnny? Have you seen Dean Sutton tonight? I tried to find him, but I couldn't. My father's been arrested, charged with murder. Yeah, I know, honey. I came here to go over the company records to see if I could find something that might help him, anything. Ellen, I... Johnny, uh... look. Look at this mess. Somebody's been here. Files dumped in the middle of the floor, papers all over the place. Yeah, it looks like they're planning to start a bonfire. Say, tell me something, Ellen. Does Dean Sutton own a boat? Yes. Light cabin cruiser named the Piper. Why? It's tied up at the wharf. He's around here somewhere. Well, what of it? I... What do you mean? Your father didn't sink the Molly Kay. Dean Sutton did it. But he wasn't even on board. He didn't have to be. He hired an explosive expert named Benny Wong to do the job. He got your father to take Benny on as steward. That's the man they're accusing father of murder. Dean is the one who did it, using your father's gun. But why? To collect the insurance on that cargo of grain. Oh, look, I know it's a rough deal, honey, and I know how you feel. But I guess your best bet is to chalk it up to experience. At least your father's in the clear now. I think I sensed it, Johnny. That something was wrong with Dean. Badly wrong. I guess that's why I felt like turning to you instead of him. Why I still feel that way. I think I'm going to cry. Then cry... Cry it out and get it over with. Come here, Ellen. I held her close and tried to comfort her. She pressed her face against my chest and whimpered like a hurt kid. I kept stroking her hair, breathing in the scent of her perfume. Perfume? The same perfume that had hung in the air of the room where Benny Wong was killed. The pieces shifted, fell into place again. The puzzle was finally solved, but too late, because I could feel the muzzle of the gun she was pressing against my side. Easy now, Johnny. Turn around slow and get your hands up. That's the idea. Now stay that way. I'm a dead shot, Johnny. You doubt it, ask Benny Wong. Right under my nose. Right from the start. How wrong can a guy be? As wrong as you were, Johnny. It had to be you. There was no chance for Dean to steal your father's gun and then return it. Not unless you were in on it with him. It was my idea. Dean's too weak to plan a thing like that. He has to be propped up and pushed. And you're just the girl to do it. You ought to know. Yeah, I do now. It's too bad. I like the way you kiss. Any chance of working something out, Johnny? Or are you too honest? So that's it. The next step is to get rid of Dean... 
And you've already got the trap set. Not yet, but I'll think of something. I'm clever, Johnny. Don't you think so? I heard footsteps coming along the wharf. Dean Sutton. I had only seconds to think of something, so I took a chance, edged back against the wall, inched over closer to the door. That's far enough. Don't push your luck. There's Dean coming now. He went after some gasoline. We're going to build a nice warm fire, and you're going to have a ringside seat. Come on in, Dean. We've got a visitor. Uh, Dollar. What do you know? So you walked right into it. Just like a cop. Chance paid off. He walked between us, blocked Ellen's line of fire, and I jumped him. I grabbed him around the neck, held him as a shield, dragged him back out through the door, out to the wharf. Dean! Break loose! Let me get a shot at him! I was trying to get clear of the light before Ellen could blast me with that gun, and I made it. But Dean broke loose, came at me swinging. Let me slip and staggered up against the dock rail. The railing broke, split in two, and we went over the side. We struggled back up to the surface. Dean's hands were clenched on my throat, and I couldn't break his grip. Ellen started firing from the wharf above us, not knowing who she'd hit and not caring. I took a deep breath and dragged Dean under the surface. But his hands were still on my throat, and I couldn't break loose. My lungs were bursting. My strength was going fast. I brought up my knee. He fell away from me. I was free, free to fight my way back up to the surface. I swam around in circles, getting my breath, watching for Dean. But he didn't come up. He didn't come up for two days. When I climbed up the ladder onto the wharf, Alan was nowhere in sight. I heard somebody running toward me, saw the flashing red light back at the land end of the pier, and I knew why she'd left. Dan McKay and his boys. Johnny! Johnny! Hey, over here, Dan. Are you all right, Johnny? Yeah, I'm all right. Do you see Ellen Brawley? Well, some girl ran up the wharf there, tore that cruiser. That boat's got a booby trap on it. Come on, Dan. All right. What's she doing here? She was in on it, too. Dean's in the water, drowned, I guess. Look, there she is, climbing down off the wharf. Ellen, stop. She's on the cruiser. No. Ellen! She's gonna try... Look out! Get down! Flat on your face if she opens that hand... Blown to bits. Booby trap. They had it rigged for me, and she... No... She didn't know about it. That wasn't meant for me. They were both pulling a double cross. Dean set that trap for her. End of expense account, except hotel and plane fare back home. Total $547.60. Well, it looks like the company pays off on this one, Dave. The ship owner was innocent. But you'll make it back. I really feel sorry for Captain Brawley. He commanded his own quarterdeck for 25 years. Strong and proud and unafraid. He had a wife once named Molly Kay and a ship named Molly Kay. And he had a daughter, too. And now the sea has taken all of them away from him and left him cast up on the beach, a broken old man. Bitter, beaten, alone. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star, Bob Bailey, to tell you about next week's story. Thanks. Next week, the case of a man who didn't exist, except for one thing. He suddenly showed up. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, the entire production is under the direction of Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Virginia Gregg, Peter Leeds, Barney Phillips, Victor Perrin, James McCallion, and High Aberback. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. <laughs> 